<laughs> All right, let's um, let's open up with prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us here in this time and opportunity to uh, once more um, consider your work in our lives and the lives of your church. So bless our time and our conversation today. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, today what we're going to be looking at um, is we're going to finish up sort of talking about the monastic stuff, but also um, some other things and some um, kind of how Lutherans treat some of this kind of stuff too. Um, and uh, so that'll probably take up a little bit. So that's, um, that's where we're going. There's a new handout over there. Um, there was a photocopy. We're going to get to that here in just a minute. But it's a photocopy out of a book, uh, The Treasury of Daily Prayer. And it's the um, part of the introduction for that. And I bring that up because um, there's some connection to um, to some of the monastic stuff that we are talking about, but also um, highlights the way that God's people have uh, been engaged in worship and in devotions for most of history. Okay. So we're going to look at that here in just a moment. Before we get there, though. Um, you know, so we talked about kind of the beginnings of monasticism um, a little bit as well. And this is still a very important aspect of Christianity as a whole. Right? Roman Catholics still have them. Um, all the Eastern Orthodox branches still have it. Uh, some in Anglicanism still do it as well. Um, but it's not really it's something in, um, in Lutheranism. And so we want to talk about why. And... Um, and that will also segue then into that handout that I gave you. But um, first of all, Lutherans have a pretty good uh, uh, response and approach to uh, monasticism, at least the way it was done in the medieval ages. Because um, a lot of the first reformers, um, their lives were shaped by, um, by monks, nuns, um, and this kind of living, okay? And this has a huge, actually has a huge implication um, at the time of the Reformation. Now, things are a little bit different today in uh, when it comes to uh, monasticism in the Roman Catholic Church, but there still is, um, there still, there still are a lot of points of comparison. So, um, the Reformation very much shaped then by uh, by Luther, who was first a monk. I right, you remember the way that Luther became a monk? Yeah. Huh? The big thunderstorm, right? Yeah. So he's caught in the big thunderstorm and he prays. Who does he pray to? Yeah. Saint, I think it's Saint Anne. Yeah. So um, he prays to a saint first of all, and basically makes this deal and says, um, uh, you know, help get me out of here, and if you do, um, then I'll become a monk. Right? Um, and uh, so uh, he gets out of it, and so he joins the monastery, and it's not, um, it's not very, um, or his parents are very happy with him at the time. His dad wants him to be a lawyer. How old was he, Pastor? Um, he was in his late teens. Yeah. He died early. Wait for it. And, uh, uh, he, was 50, he was in his 50s. So, um, anyway, so he, he joins the monastery. What kind of monastery um, does he end up becoming part of? You guys remember? Yeah, Augustinian. Okay, so he's an Augustinian monk. The other biggies, of course, the, at the time were the, the Benedictines. We talked about those. But also you have the Franciscans, right, after St. Francis of Assisi. And each of these kind of have different, uh, different nuances and focuses on uh, what they do, how they go about uh, living their lives of prayer and work and the different balances between those things. Okay. When did the Jesuits come along <laughs> Um, after the Reformation, yeah, so there are forms, uh, Ignatius of Loyola is the, the beginner of that, um, so that's a specifically um, an anti-Reformation monastic movement. 
So, along those little segue, along those lines, which is, I don't know, neither here nor there, I guess, but it's interesting. Um, the, uh, today's the last Sunday of the church here. Right? So next Sunday is Advent, and so we kind of start the church here over again. So in the 20s, the Roman Catholic Pope um, created a new holiday. Um, and um, he created this is um, really kind of in the aftermath of World War I, but also in a large part because of the rise of Mussolini. Okay? And so he creates this holiday and calls it Christ the King Sunday. And the emphasis on that is that Christ is the king, right, even over um, the earthly, earthly kings and monarchs, and you've got a whole bunch of social upheaval in Europe at this time. Monarchies are kind of going away, and it's being replaced by other things. You have the rise of some dictators um, and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, the Pope uh, institutes this new holiday, Christ the King Sunday. And um, the day that he places it on is the last Sunday in October to compete with Reformation Sunday. So he specifically does that and puts it in the last Sunday in October. Um, and then um, after uh, in Vatican II, which is in the 1960s, that gets moved to the last Sunday of the church. Um, but um, that's just kind of interesting. Uh, uh, still in the 1920s, right, the Roman Catholic Church is addressing the, the Reformation in that kind of way. So it creates a new holiday to compete with, um, with what not just Lutherans were doing with the Reformation, but others. So, anyway, back to monastic stuff. So, uh, Luther's a monk, so he grows up in this, he knows this very well. Um, and he also, so he knows um, some of the positive stuff of it, he knows the negative side of it, and he never feels like he's good enough, right? So to the point where he's constantly confessing his sins, which is a big thing in, in the monastic movement again, as we talked about, and there's a lot more introspective stuff to it, but to the point where his father confessor ends up getting mad at him and says, you know, you it's only been two hours, and you, you know, you just went right back to your cell, and you've been praying the whole time. What possible sins could you have committed, right? That you got to come back and and spend more time. With this. And so um, he's he's very much burdened by um, by feelings of guilt and shame, and um, that he's not good enough, even if his outward actions might be good. Um, he's got a lot of anger probably suffered with a lot of depression um, and loneliness and that kind of thing that, that we said often happens too. Over there. Um, he goes to Rome, help, hoping that's going to help him a little bit. His father confessor says go there. and um, When he sees um, two, two or three big things, it really shakes him up. One of them is you know, he crawls paths with uh, brothels that are specifically set out for priests and monks. Right. So um, that doesn't seem quite right. Yeah. Um, there, he sees um, a lot of the, um, the the greed that was had been going on at that time in the church, and that ended up getting uh, wrapped up into indulgences. Right. So then they'd say, you know, uh, the famous line, right? When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> so, and um, there had been a, a new wave around this time of indulgences, um, and some people were taking great, we're going to talk about indulgences later, but um, take great advantage of this um, and do some pretty bad things. But one of the, um, they were doing this because this was right at the time when they're building St. Peter's Cathedral in Vatican in Rome. And this is one of the major funding. Um, ways yeah. that, they're, that they're trying to do that is there um, a new it's round of indulgences, right? So we'll forgive your sins if you pay us money. And we'll forgive the sins of your dead grandmas in purgatory if you pay us money. Or we'll take time off. Um, and the more you pay, the more time they get off. Or you know, they get given up, they get transferred over. How do they know something that they already paid for grandma to get out of it? 
That's if you don't know. Like, yeah, that's beside the point. That's beside the point. So they're trying to make money. So, um, so anyway, so these things really shake him. It's it's kind of this big revelation, of course, at, at Luther when he comes across uh, these passages when he really reads Romans and he hears about how. Um, about the righteousness of God, the righteousness um, of God that, that God requires, and that the, the righteous shall live by faith. And what, what the realization kind of comes to is that the righteousness of God is not the righteousness that we do towards God, but it's God's righteousness that he gives to us, right, that Jesus does. And that by faith, Christ's righteousness is our own. So it totally reshapes him the way that, um, that he goes about things. Now, at the time, too, um, for in monasticism, the um, there was very much this idea that if you that um, the the serious Christians, the real Christians, the ones that would actually get to heaven and maybe get to skip purgatory, um, were the monks, the nuns, and the priests. These were the good ones, right? And so, if you really wanted to do this, and if you're really serious, that you would, you would go and be a monk or a priest. And what that does is that that really um, made the uh, that temptation of works righteousness even worse, right? So that now, so many that were not monks and priests had a holier than thou attitude, but also then the everyday person was left in a lot of despair and hopelessness, right? And I'm never, I'm never going to get to heaven. The best I can hope for is purgatory, which isn't a good place. That's the place where you have to uh, work off your sins. So it's, it's, closer, it's closer to hell than it is to heaven. So um, you have these issues going on. You have issues of uh, what's called the... Um, the treasury of the saints, right? So if you have the monks, the, the priests, and the saints that are really good, so how much, I mean, how much good do you have to do in order to get to heaven? Well, these guys did enough, but they actually had extra, right? So they have, they have extra ones, um, and if you pray to this or that saint, maybe he'll give you some of the extra grace that he earned, and that can be applied to you or to your dead grandma on purgatory. Sounds like baptizing the dead. Okay. So. Um, yeah. Well, that's a long. That's a long story. Uh, that's a long story. Yeah. Well, how did they get around Romans three twenty three? Well, they all don't. have sinned and fallen short. All means all. Oh, right. So, I mean, this is part. I mean, this is part of. Um, this is really part of the whole thing of the Lutheran Reformation is highlighting that kind of stuff. And when it comes even to things like justification, right, and salvation, is um, you're either saved, you know, from our perspective, it's you're saved or you're not. You're justified and declared righteous, or you're not. So there's no middle ground, because we're saved by grace, um, through faith in Christ, and not by works, right? So it's not a mixing of that kind of thing. So, which is why at the time, too, in a lot of the confessional writings um, of Lutheranism against the Roman Catholics, there's charges of um, a semi-Pelagianism. And remember, Pelagius and Augustine, are have, um, they had this big argument in the four, late 400s about the role of free will in salvation. Whose responsibility is it and whose credit right, is it? So, um, Pelagius says it's all up to the individual person. Whether you go to heaven or hell, it's all based on your choice and your actions. Right? Where Augustine was saying, no, um, your will is bound because of, this, because of your sinfulness. You're not able to choose God because you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And dead people can't choose God. So... Um, Luther, being an Augustinian monk, latches on to that kind of thing very, very much so. Roman Catholicism, and it took centuries to get to where it was, 
started leaning towards this semi-Pelagian thing and mixing works and faith and, and that kind of stuff. Okay? And still today, um, Lutherans are still under a um, condemnation by Rome saying that all who believe that you are justified by faith alone are damned. Okay. So that's part of the Council of Trent in the 1540s to 1560s. And it's been reaffirmed a couple of times too, but that still, that still is in, uh, is in um, effect. Although the uh, Roman Catholic Council of Vatican II in the 60s um, kind of lessened what that means. I guess. Can I just ask a quick question? Could that thought process that is still holding on, could that be kind of a grudge that the Roman well, church is holding I, on the way Martin Luther stood possibly, up to them? Possibly. I, think I mean, we're there's, dealing with it. Yeah, we're dealing with, with sinful human beings and all memories. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I think that certainly has a role to play. <laughs> Does the Bible say anything anywhere about purgatory? Um, in the Apocrypha is where you'll get some references to it. So the Roman Catholics would say, yes, it does. And we would say, no, it doesn't. Yeah. But isn't so that based on a mis, uh, mis, uh, reading of the uh, or mistranslation? Well, part, not, I mean, th that was penance. Penance was more on the, the mistranslation of uh, you having to do something in order to be forgiven. Um, that it's not, that you're not forgiven because you have faith in Jesus and what he's done, but because you got to earn it. you got to really mean it when you say you're sorry. And then you got to show that by your work. So, I mean, all this stuff is tied together uh, very closely. One thing I noticed reading the Apocrypha is one of the Maccabees. There was a, a military leader or, that was praying for the, the fallen soldiers, and I thought that was the closest I found to prayer. Yeah, that's where you get prayers to, to the dead. Yeah. You know, or or the why, why did you ask like, also That they still people? need something. Yeah. You know, that concept is the closest I could come to yeah. purgatory. So, um, yes. So that's part, of, that's part of the difference right there. So anyway. Back, kind of back to monasticism. Um, we, so this stuff, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to isolate one specific thing because these things are connected to so many other aspects. But in, um, in the Augsburg Confession, in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, there's articles, and I, I didn't print those out for you because they're long, it hasn't been taken a ton of paper. Um, but I'm just going to read some of this stuff um, to you. So um, this is kind of the official Lutheran response to monasticism. These, things, these documents are written by Philip Melanchthon, okay? but very much influenced by, of course, by Lutheran theology, as well as um, and monasticism is very widely known and, um, and engaged with in the Middle Ages at this time. So the... Um, um, part of the issue here, um, le or let me just read to you, this is the, uh, the editor's note to the, the edition that I'm reading. It says, um, uh, so this is an article on monastic vows, specifically on the vows and the promises that one's made. So it says, the article has in view uh, Luther's experience in the monastery along with what other former monks had to say about life in the cloister. The idea that a person should hide himself behind the walls of a monastery and perform spiritual works to make himself more worthy of God's favor has no biblical justification. During the Middle Ages, many common people believed that only priests, monks, or nuns were truly performing spiritual work. But such a view contradicts God's word, which teaches how all of life is an opportunity to serve God, giving him glory by serving our neighbor. So even today, it's sometimes assumed that activities in the church are somehow of greater value than the common everyday duties that life requires of us. Okay, so um, um, that's part of the editor's notes. So let me let me read part of this article here, and we can talk about it in the tab. But um, it starts off. So it's, it'll be easier to understand what we teach about monastic vows by considering the state of monasteries and how many things are done every day contrary to canon law. So canon law is the rules 
the laws that the church had established and the way it's supposed to function. Not biblical, so they're not biblical laws, they're earthly church laws. Okay? So, he goes on. Uh, in, Augustine's, in Augustine's time, monasteries were free associations. Later, when discipline was corrupted, vows were added for the purpose of restoring discipline. So that's Benedict is what he's talking about there. As, um, as in a carefully planned prison. Gradually, many other regulations were added besides vows. And these binding rules were laid upon many before the lawful age, contrary to canon law. So the church law says you can't make a promise and a vow to the church until you're old enough. And yet, um, you see this all the time, where people are kind of forced into making these things. And back then, you know, you're keeping your word, that kind of honesty, fulfilling a vow, um, wrapped up in, you know, in, to who you are, your name. That kind of stuff was way more important in society than it is now. That's so, exactly what the Jews did. Yeah. Like, they took the Ten Commandments and they ran with it. It is. And it they, is. And, and, and so Jesus that's... came to fulfill that law. Right. So. And that's been, that's part of our, that's part of the Lutheran response is, look, we're going, it's very pharisaical. You're going back to the same, you've fallen into the same temptation and trap that the Pharisees were doing. And even though a lot of these things were initially started for good reason, right, over time, just our sinful nature corrupts those things and, and twists them. So, um, so that's one of the things, is people are making lifelong vows and they're not really old enough or even well informed enough to be able to and the vows, primarily they're making, are vows of um, chastity, right? I'm not going to get married, okay? Lifelong vows, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big stretch to, you know, for a 14-year-old to make a vow like that, okay? Um, poverty, right? So um, you're never going to own personal possessions, right? And you're just going to live this life of poverty. But also um, living away from society. Right? So separating yourself from family, from friends, and that kind of thing. So um, it goes on a little bit later. It says, um, um, in addition to all these evil things, a view of vows was added that, dis, um, that displeased even the more considerate monks. They taught that monastic vows were equal to baptism. In other words, they're salvific. They taught that monastic life merited, earned forgiveness of sins and justification before God. Yes, they even added that the monastic life not only merited righteousness before God, but even greater merit since it was said that the monastic life not only kept God's basic laws, so that's the Ten Commandments, but also the so-called evangelical councils. So, again, that this is kind of the higher level of Christian. That, that can follow all the rules better than the normal everyday person can. And then by doing that, that they're also then closer to God. Okay. So if they're closer to God, and this, this plays into, again, uh, invocation of the saints, right? Um, either praying to the saints or saying, asking a saint to pray for you, or going to Mary and saying, look, uh, I'm going to pray to St. Christopher, and um, because I know that he was a, a better Christian than I was, so he's going to have a little more pull, right, with Jesus. So I'm going to go to him first and ask him to go on my behalf to somebody. And this is a different thing from our perspective. This is very different than I'm sick, and so I call up one of you guys and say, yeah, I'm having a hard time. Can you pray for me? That's a different thing. Than, than, because I'm not, I'm not, you know, we don't approach that thinking somehow you have more credit with God than I do, or my prayers aren't sufficient enough. But we're trying to gather the, the mutual consolation of brothers and sisters in Christ, right? and to, to pray for one another like God invites us to do. But that's again, that's different than I, I'm going to go up to a higher up because I'm not able 
or I'm not worthy enough to go straight to God himself. Put a lot of bureaucracy between you and Christ. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So, so this is part of the um, the problem or the vows that they're making. This idea that if you live there, that somehow you're a better Christian, that you're closer to God, that you um, earn righteousness more than what a, um, a normal one can do. And so um, it goes on um, and says, um, let me see where is it here. Um, so it talks more about, you know, is it is it fair to, for someone who um, is young or not aware of what they're doing to make a lifelong vow? And, if they break that vow, um, if that, um, for some, that would carry um, condemnation or you'd be excommunicated from the church. Right? So um, there's some issue with that and saying, well, that's not, that's not necessarily or shouldn't be the case either. So um, that's part of it. Now, in the, um, in the Augsburg Confession, that's, it's initially laid out, this is what we believe about this stuff. The Roman Catholic Church comes back, it's called confutation, and they don't like what the, what the Lutherans have to say about this, so then the Lutherans come back again, and that's the apology of the Augsburg Confession, the defense. And so there's more talk here in the defense about this, um, or the apology of the Augsburg Confession, um, saying, you know, these things are not... Um, it's not scriptural, right? The Bible doesn't say you have to do this kind of thing. Um, it also highlights that monasteries primarily and initially were places of learning, of education, for training priests, pastors, right? So kind of a seminary or school um, for, for people that are going to do church work to preserve um, the manuscripts, right? Copies of the Bible and, um, and places of evangelism. And so in the apology, it says that's what they were originally created for, and that's good, and that's what these things should be like if we're going to have that it should be a voluntary association, right? So you're doing this because you, you want to. Also, especially when it comes to nuns, um, that was often, you know, if you have um, eight or ten kids and you're a dirt poor farmer and um, you have six daughters that aren't helping you out in the field, and now all of a sudden your wife's pregnant again, and you're like, I can barely feed who I have, and I need, I need boys to work for me. Then I need some place for this girl to go. And so they sent them off to a convent. Right? That was a very, very common thing, um, especially for unwanted females. So um, you say, well, that's bad, right? Um, um, but the church has created orphanages that help to deal with that kind of stuff. But putting them in a convent where then vows are forced upon them and saying, now, you know, you're, you can never get married because your parents gave us to you when you were five years old. And um, now we're going to make you make this promise that you can, you'll never get married and you'll never have children. Right? We say, well, that's bad. Um, so there's a lot of that, um, a lot of that kind of stuff in here. But really, what it is, it's a call for. There's two things that, that um, of importance, and then we're going to segue to that handout that I gave you here. The two big or three big things. One, uh, we can't make people make vows and promises that they're not willing to make, and you can't hold it to them. And yes, if you make a promise and a vow and you break that, that's not good, right? That's um, that's. Uh, your break, breaking a promise is bad, right? If you're going to say something, you need to you need to follow through, and you need to need it. At the same time, right? There's forgiveness for that kind of stuff too, especially when situations change. Right? So that's one of them too. Um, um, these places need to go back to what they were originally intended to be: places of learning, of education, of preparation for church work and evangelism. Um, and three, um, um, uh, you don't you you don't earn righteousness. You don't earn more of God's love and favor by doing this. And this isn't a better tier and level of Christianity. 
So what it does say, so all of a sudden this kind of stuff comes out, and so Lutheran monasteries or monasteries in Lutheran areas all of a sudden dis not disappear, but pretty well close disappear. Because everybody now leaves. So the some that say that same, a lot of the education aspect gets picked up by the universities, by the public universities. So like Whitmer, okay? Um, so these kind of fill in that niche of we're going to train people to be, to be pastors, to be teachers, to be uh, workers in the church, but also just good Christians in society. So even though the physical, the physical ideas of that kind of go away, really what, what gets promoted is this idea and clarification of Christian vocation. Right? That, that we are called to, be, uh, to live in the world, but not of the world. And that in order to, that we don't have to separate ourselves from society in order to be more holy and pure Christians. But, but that kind of living is basically saying it's being transferred from the monasteries now into the Christian home and into the Christian life, the everyday life. So how, where do we do good works and how do we best serve God to the neighbors that are closest around us, which would first be our families, right? So it's a, it is a good and a holy and um, a righteous work when a, when a Christian parent changes a poopy diaper. Because there's a helpless person in need, and mom and dad change the diaper and feed the baby. Right? It's a good and, and, um, and holy and Christian work where you see a neighbor who um, is elderly at this time of the year and can't rake up all the leaves in the yard, so you go and help. So, and that, that thing gets extended to say this kind of work and serving your neighbor is just done in everyday life. And there isn't anything more holy about church work and something that I may do as the pastor than changing the word or helping out somebody who's in need. And these are all good works in the eyes of God. Luther's wife, wasn't, he, wasn't she a, a nun? She was a nun, yeah. Yeah, and the baby. That whole, that nunnery was being dissolved or something. Yeah, well, it, it eventually was. So she was part of a group of runaway nuns. Oh. And then when this was going, <laughs> okay. a whole bunch of them yeah, they stuck out. Was the one they couldn't <laughs> Right. And um, all that whole group of nuns, uh, Luther played matchmaking, matched a whole bunch of nuns and moms together. And um, Katie refused to be married. She left to marry anybody else. And Luther didn't want to get married at all. Um, and Katie said, I'm not, you're going to marry me. And she goes, drug him into that. <laughs> And it worked out really well. It worked out very well. Like, he, she knew. I thought that's fascinating. Right, right. Yeah. So, if, um, if the monastic life was primarily centered around the Benedictine slogan again, right? It's ora et labora. So, prayer and work, right? Again, from, from our perspective then, and it's, and it's all because of justification and what justification is. That we're righteous in the sight of God because through faith in Christ, not through what we're doing. That then means that what we do, though, flowing out of that faith that we have and out of that declaration we have from God, that we ought to be encouraged even all the more to do good works. That we don't have to hide ourselves away from society, but we actually can do these good works and very normal, everyday ways right, to our family and to our friends. And so that's where the work aspect comes into things. Okay? And then also if you're a Christian, whatever job you're doing, you do that by your Christian um, values. Right? So if you're a businessman, you don't, try to, you don't try to cheat and swindle people. Right? You do things in an honest way. You have a, a quality that you strive for and that you work for, integrity and honesty, um, honor, all of that kind of stuff. 
that should just exist in your everyday life. Um, so that's the work aspect. The second aspect now is the prayer aspect. Okay? And we don't often think of prayer in this way, but what's the um, but prayer in itself is a good work. Right? So what's the second commandment? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, right? Or use the name of the Lord your God in vain. Right? So in Luther's explanation of the second commandment, we should fear and love God right? so that we don't misuse this, right? We don't curse, swear, use satanic arts, or lie by his name, but instead we call upon him every prayer for his um, give thanks. So, prayer itself is a good work. It's a fulfillment of one of the Ten Commandments. And it's not a physical work in the same way as, um, as in manual labor is, but prayer itself is, um, is a good work in fulfillment of the Second Commandment on calling on the name of God in all these different circumstances. Right? So, um, as, as Luther's also going around into society, and he's finding out that people, even a lot of the, the pastors, they don't know the Ten Commandments. Right? They, don't, they don't know the Apostles' Creed. They don't know the, the Lord's Prayer. So Luther says, I'm going to give you this little handbook and devotional thing to help you on these things, and that's called the Small Catechism. Right? And he preaches sermons about each of these. That's called the Large Catechism. Okay? And as he does this, when it comes especially to the prayer aspect, again, his life being so shaped by this life of the monasteries and his daily routine of prayer, Luther says, this is great. As Christians, we ought to, you know, the scripture says, pray, pray <coughs> ceasingly or unceasingly, right? Continue to do this. Do it all of the time. And so what he does, and you see this in the small catechism, but then it expands more um, in other ways too. So even in the small catechism, he says, I'm going to give you then just your average everyday person some sample prayers and ideas on how to do things on a daily basis and a routine. So when you wake up in the morning, you make the sign of the cross and you say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all that. Then you recite the, the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. Why? Because nobody knows that. And so people, this is the way you learn it, right? It's repetition. And so you pick up your small catechism and you start and you, you uh, read the Apostles' Creed. You pray the Lord's Prayer. And then if you have time, you say this prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously given me this night. Danger, and I pray that you can say also sin and never evil, but all my doings and life gave you reason. So he gives up that prayer in the morning, does a similar thing in the evening before you go to bed, do the same thing. Right? And then he says, before you eat, here's a here's a little prayer for in a psalm. Right? Pray a psalm, and then a little prayer before you eat. Um, um, the eyes of all look to you, O Lord. Right? That's how it starts. And then um, Bless us, O Lord, and these your gifts, which we receive by your crown of goodness, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Which isn't a new prayer. Um, it, that was a long-standing prayer um, that um, uh, I, well, at least for me, um, it's been revitalized because I watch Blue Bloods. And they say that prayer all the time before their meetings. Right? So, um, I mean, and that's, a, that's an old ancient prayer, so that's not a new composition by Luther. He just said, hey, this is a really common prayer that we prayed in the monasteries, and the Christians have been praying for a while. So bring that into a home, into your dinner table. And then after you eat, you say a little prayer of thanksgiving for the food, and you go back your own way. Right? If you really want to be, uh, you know, really, really good, too, especially in the morning one, um, it says, you know, after you day your prayers, you know, you go about your day and you sing a hymn, maybe like a hymn on the Ten Commandments, okay? Which he writes, these are the Holy Ten Commandments. Um, and this is part of the way that the Reformation spreads, right? Is by the prayer life of the Lutherans and by them daily reciting the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, 
right? Praying these kinds of prayers, which isn't foreign to the Christian community, but for the most part was regulated to the monasteries and just the churches. Now all of this stuff gets translated and moved into the Christian law. It says now, parents, you guys are the abbot and the abbotess of your little monastery at home, where you get to teach your children how to pray and how to do good works and so And we get to shape and model our life at, you know, around the Word of God. So, look at that handout that you have here, real quick. Um, this handout is um, um, part of this book called um, The Treasury of David Prayer, which, um, this is what it looks like, um, which is a fantastic book. If you're, if you're ever in need of a devotional book, this I, would be my number one recommendation. So it follows what's called the Daily Lectionary that um, was comprised um, a little over 100 years ago uh, in the Lutheran circles, the, this one that we're using. But it goes through all the New Testament in a year and about two-thirds of the Old Testament. Okay? So then every day you just have an a Old Testament reading and um, a New Testament reading. Um, also included in this, this is part of why I like it as well, you have a writing from one of the church fathers in there. So there's a lot of Luther, there's a lot of stuff from the Book of Concord, but you get stuff from Augustine, you get stuff from Benedict, uh, from Ambrose, um, from all of these kind of guys. Whenever it's a uh, day that we remember one of the saints or a specific event, there's usually a little biography of that person too, or what's going on. There's a hymn verse, which usually matches up with what's going on, and a prayer as well. So this goes through every day of the year, um, and, um, and is a great little resource here. But what I want to look at in that handout there, um, this is part of the introduction, and it talks about what's called the daily office. Okay, the daily office. So um, let's read some of this. It says, uh, Christian prayer is rooted in the Word of God. We hear the voice of God through the Holy Scriptures. As we receive His Word from God, the heart of faith desires to respond. It's out of this receiving of God's word and the desire to respond that conversation with God, which is prayer, happens. The ancient form of structured prayer through the day, often called the daily office or the liturgy of the hours, is not simply a way to encourage Christians to pray. Excuse me, rather, it's a tool developed by the church to instruct us in prayer and faith, a means to keep our conversation with God rooted in his word. So, that's what we talked about last week. Remember, in the monasteries, you had these seven times during the day that people would pray. Right? So we looked at kind of your normal schedule for what um, for what monastic life would look like. They'd wake up at 2 a.m., and they'd pray for a little while, and then um, they'd have some meditation time, and then they'd go back to pray for a while, and then they'd eat, and then they'd go back to pray for a little while, and then they'd work. Um, and it goes on and on. So that last week's handout, you had that basic um, schedule. Okay. Um, between six and eight o'clock. And yeah. they woke up at two a.m. and they were up for. Yep, up for the rest of the time. For, I mean, you take little short naps, especially depending on where you were. So farther north, you know, uh, the daylight hours are less, right? So they would usually go to bed earlier. Um, uh, farther south, you had more daylight hours, but it was hotter, and so you'd take a siesta. So that was usually built into it. So, um, I'm not going to read all this, but you guys can do that at home if you'd like. Um, it talks about the Old Testament background of this. Going all the way back in the Old Testament, you have fixed hours of prayer. So you have the morning sacrifice, time of the morning sacrifice, and the evening sacrifice. Morning sacrifice was typically at 9 a.m., evening sacrifice at 3 p.m. Okay, so that's where, um, you know, when people would bring in um, not just, you know, not just kind of your typical lambs and goats, but grain offerings, peace offerings, um, any of that kind of stuff. Twice a day, typically, is when that, when that was burned, when that was offered up to God at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So... That's where all this stuff kind of starts. If you look in the, the right-hand column there, um, it says the development of the daily office. So 
The chief purpose for the practice of the daily office is the sanctification and the marking of time. So we have a quote from Mark 13. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And this is the main theme of the last Sunday of the church here. Um, we're going to hear the parable of the ten virgins. Right, where five are ready and five are not. Um, but the whole point of that is Christ is coming. Be alert. Stay awake. Stay ready because you don't know when he's going to come. So the, the purpose then of the daily office and the development was to help people pay attention, stay awake, look for Christ because he's coming. So that was part of what the... Uh, the cycle of prayer was focused on, while the work aspect then is, was originally focused on then serving your neighbor. Right? Preparation for Christ to come. In the meantime, I help my neighbor out. Okay? So, in the, going on, it says, In the ancient world, the time between dawn and dusk was divided at recognized points, the third, sixth, and ninth hours. So Christians found it natural to mark the passing of time of the day with prayer at these times. So for the most part, these daytime prayers were private or family prayers within the home. By the middle of the third century, the hour of prayer became commemorations of the work of Christ. Daybreak celebrated the resurrection. The third hour, the condemnation of Christ. The sixth hour, the crucifixion. The ninth hour, Jesus' death. Evening, um, the rest of the tomb, or the light of Christ in the darkness of the world. So with this development, it became common for the liturgy of the hours to be prayed by the congregation gathered together at this purpose. Okay? So, in the Old Testament, you have the daily sacrifices. As the New Testament starts to roll around, this gets more involved just in the family. Right? Then, by the 3rd and 4th and 5th centuries, this is getting transferred back, um, basically, in the context of church, and then of the, mo of the monasteries. Okay? Now, then, by the 15th or 16th century in the Reformation, there's an emphasis on, let's get this back into the Christian home. So, um, you see on, on page 18, on that second page there, this is the system that by the Reformation in the Middle Ages, what is going on, the schedule of prayer that is going on here. So, Originally, the letter of hours then distributed throughout the days. You have matins, lauds, prime, terce, sex, nun, vespers, and call. Okay. So about every three hours spaced out throughout the day. Okay. Now, things um, mod were modified a little bit here and there on time and circumstance. Um, the right-hand column on that page 18, the daily office in the Lutheran tradition. So, Martin Luther took matins and vespers out of the monastery and formulated these two prayer services for congregational use. While both services focus on praise and reflection of Scripture, Luther's modifications made matins and vespers ideal preaching services. So, in the monasteries, there wasn't preaching that went around this. It was mostly prayer and, and maybe some private kind of contemplation about things. <coughs> Luther kind of swishes together several of the morning hours and canonical hours here, and then several of the evening ones into two, matins and vespers, and then there's also an emphasis on preaching, on an exhortation or a teaching about the Bible passages that you've been reading. Okay? And this was, at the time of the Reformation, this was a foreign idea. You didn't, you didn't have preaching like this in, the, in this kind of cycle. Okay? So, um, that gets um, introduced. So, as a rhythm, or Lutherans um, have, going on, it says, Lutherans have seldom felt compelled to use all 150 psalms within a uh, prescribed period of time, nor do they read the whole Bible each year in the course of these services. So, um, you remember the Benedictines would read all 150 once a week? And Lutheran said, let's not turn reading the Bible into a burden. Right, and into a chore, or just kind of being, going through it just because. But we want it so it's beneficial to our faith. Okay. 
And there are some parts that are a little more beneficial to read more often than others. I mean, not very often do we say, um, you know, we need to go back and reread the book of Numbers over and over and over again every month. Um, you know, it would be much better to say we're going to read one of the Gospels every month, right? It's going to be a lot more beneficial. So, it's that kind of thing. Um, as a result, almost all these other, the cycle of other prayers are almost lost. And so it gets whittled down to basically two, matins and vespers. Okay? So, those then, as Lutherans start to publish more hymnals and service books and that kind of stuff, those services get put in there as well. And that's kind of what um, what gets carried down even to our day. Um, is that kind of thing. Now, um, a lot of what we do as well, uh, we worked in tandem with the Anglicans in a lot of different ways on how this works and how this is done. So what you find in the conservative Anglican churches and in the Lutheran churches are going to be very similar in style and language um, and in the reason on why we do some of this. So, um, this gets wrapped into the, the church life, so it becomes very common then that in churches, you would have on a daily basis, um, church the pastor of the church would, would um, have the church building open for matins and vespers every day for any anybody of the congregation or community who wanted to come to church and do this. If the church had a school, that often got wrapped up in the school, too. So they would open up the school day with matins. They would close the school day with vespers. So as the mom and dad were dropping their kids off at, at school, they would stay for one of these things, which typically only takes about 30 minutes. So that thing kind of gets translated, too, into the way that um, we do a chapel. Like at our school, we only have chapel once a week. But we have opening devotions where we follow a little liturgy and we read through the scripture readings for the upcoming Sunday. Um, there's no preaching attached to it. It's just listen to the word of God right, and pray about some specific things as we go throughout. But it's, very, it's becoming more common in Lutheran circles, um, especially uh, with classical Lutheran schools like what we do, to have a daily, um, to do matins on a daily basis and make investments to just take 30 minutes before school and after school to, to do this kind of stuff. Which is great in the ideal world. It's a lot harder practically, especially when your church and school aren't right next door and your church isn't able, the school isn't able just to hop into the sanctuary and do this kind of stuff. So, anyway, um, last thing and then we'll be done. But, um, this also, it's not just for the churches. Again, this gets transferred back into the Christian home. And so on page 19, you have um, um, this um, pattern on how to do this kind of thing if somebody would want to do that using the church services that are in the hymnal that also get put in here in the Treasury of Daily Prayer. Right? So in the middle section, it's colored a little bit different. You have Matins and Vespers, Morning Prayer, Evening Prayer, Comp Lines, so there's some prayer and preaching, Responsive Prayer 1, Responsive Prayer 2, and 4, Daily Prayers. Okay? So on page 18 in there, um, on that handout, or page 19, I'm sorry, you have different ways that you could do this in the church or at home just to provide a little bit of a structure in a life of devotion. This book here is specifically designed to allow you to do that, to have everything in one volume to do that. The hymnal can be used as well. Um, but there's also these other resources. Um, you guys can look at them if you want. Um, I'll just leave them up here. Um, this one is called um, Oremus. It's put out by um, a pastor named David Kind, who's in um, he's at a university. I don't remember where. Michigan? Somewhere like that. Yeah. Um, so you're a campus pastor. So it's called a breviary. Right? And other traditions have these things too. So this is basically a daily devotion. So every day you have devotions. And this one is pretty well worked out for the seven canonical hours. So you could do this seven times a day. You could read a little devotion in the Bible passage. And it's keyed to um, the Sunday morning scripture reading. So it follows the theme. 
Um, you have this, so that's called a breviary, is a da basically a daily devotion. You have a thing called a missal, which is um, more towards the Sundays and for like a big church service. Lutheranism, um, for um, 200 years, hasn't really had a missal. But there's little groups within Lutheranism that does this. This one's called the Brotherhood Prayer Book. And this allows you to do a full church service any day of the year. Like it has readings and how to modify the normal divine service if you're having communion or if you're not, um, and that kind of thing. Um, so we have this. There's a gigantic project going on right now in the Missouri Synod that's looking at all of these sorts of resources, primarily in uh, Germany and that whole part of Europe, going back to about the 1300s, 1200s, 1300s, compiling all of the scripture readings that people typically did throughout the day, but also on Sundays and putting this together in one volume, which is going to be a, it's a giant task. So there's about 50 people that have been working on it for several years trying to do this, um, which would be a great devotional resource as well as just a good resource for the church to say, um, in Advent, we come up in Advent, we have these special you know, church services in Advent and Lent. Most of the time, the pastors and the churches are just kind of left to their own to figure out, so what are we going to do? Right? Are we going to go through a series um, and that kind of thing? Will these kinds of things get guidance and direction to say this is how, for hundreds of years, um, how the Christian church has dealt with this kind of stuff? So, you guys can look at any of these uh, resources. I'll just leave them up here um, if you want to take a little glance at them. Last thing, and then we'll pray. We also have this little book called the Concordia Psalter, which is just the book of Psalms, but it has tunes in here to sing it and different schedules. If you want to pray through the Psalms every week, or if you want to pray through them every month, or if you want to attach them to all of the church services that are in here, which ones fit up with certain kinds of days. And, um, the methodology of that goes back to the early monasteries. So, there's a lot of info. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, feel, again, feel free to come up here and take a look at any of these resources if you want. Um, and if you're interested in anything or learning more, just let me know. Okay? Next week, we'll go back to the... Um, to the councils. We got three more to go. So my goal is by Christmas to be done with that cycle. And then after Christmas, maybe start with your saints. Okay? Alright, let's um, let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. And we ask that you would order our days and our lives around you, around your word, the salvation and faith that we have in Jesus. And um, that in doing so, you would also help us to um, be good and faithful servants to our families, to our neighbors, to serve those who are in need, and to share that good news and the salvation we have in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.